in memoriam and preface to nothing of importance a record of eight months at the front with a welsh battalion october nineteen fifteen to june nineteen sixteen by bernard adams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lee smalley in memoriam bernard adams john bernard pye adams was born on november fifteenth eighteen ninety at beckenham kent from his first school at clare house beckenham he obtained an entrance scholarship to malvern where he gained many classical and english prizes and became house prefect in december nineteen o eight he won an open classical scholarship at st john's college cambridge where he went into residence in october nineteen o nine he was awarded in nineteen eleven sir william brown's gold medals open to the university for a greek epigram and a latin ode and in nineteen twelve he won the medal for the greek epigram again and graduated with a first class in the classical tripos in his fourth year he read economics on leaving cambridge he was appointed by the india office to be warden and assistant educational adviser at the hostel for indian students at cromwell road south kensington he threw himself writes dr t w arnold c i e secretary of indian students with the enthusiasm of his ardent nature into the various activities connected with twenty one cromwell road and endeared himself both to the indian students and to his colleagues adams was always a quiet man but his high abilities despite his unobtrusiveness could not be altogether hidden and in london as in cambridge his intellect and his gift for friendship had their natural outcome mr e w mallet of the india office bears testimony to the very high value which we all set on his work he had great gifts of sympathy and character strength as well as kindliness influence as well as understanding and these qualities won him in the rather difficult work in which he helped so loyally and well a rare and noticeable measure of esteem on his side he felt that the choice had been a right one he liked his work and he learned a great deal from it his ultimate purpose was missionary work in india and the london experience brought him into close touch with indians from every part of india and of every religion in november nineteen fourteen he joined up as lieutenant in the welsh regiment with which these pages deal and he obtained a temporary captaincy in the following spring when he went out to the front in october nineteen fifteen he resumed his lieutenancy but was very shortly given charge of a company a position which he retained until he was wounded in june nineteen sixteen when he returned to england he only went out to the front again on january thirty first of this year in the afternoon of february twenty sixth he was wounded while leading his men in an attack and died the following day in the field hospital these few sentences record the bare landmarks of a career which in the judgment of his friends would have been noteworthy had it not been so prematurely cut short for instance here is what his friend t r glover of st john's wrote in the eagle the st john's college magazine and elsewhere bernard adams was my pupil during his classical days at st john's and we were brought into very close relations he remains in my mind as one of the very best men i have ever had to teach best in every way in mind and soul and all his nature he had a natural gift for writing a natural habit of style he wrote without artifice and achieved the expression of what he thought and what he felt in language that was simple and direct and pleasing a college prize essay of his of those days was printed in the eagle volume twenty seven pages forty seven to sixty on wordsworth's prelude he was a man of the quiet and reserved kind who did not talk much for whom perhaps writing was a more obvious form of utterance than speech it was clear to those who knew him that he put conscience into his thinking he was serious above all about religion and he was honest with himself other people will take religion at second hand 
He was of another type. He thought things out quietly and clearly, and then decided. His choice of economics as a second subject at Cambridge was dictated by the feeling that it would prepare him for his life's work in the Christian ministry. There was little hope in it of much academic distinction, but that was not his object. A man who had thought more of himself would have gone on with classics, in the hope, a very reasonable one, of a fellowship. Adams was not working for his own advancement. The quiet simple way in which, without referring to it, he dismissed academic distinction gives the measure of the man, clear, definite, unselfish, and devoted. His ideal was service, and he prepared for it, at Cambridge and with his Indian students in London. When the war came, he had difficulties of decision as to the course he should pursue. Like others who had no gust for war, and no animosity against the enemy, he took a commission, not so much to fight against as to fight for. The principles at stake appealed to him, and with an inner reluctance against the whole business he went into it, once again the quiet, thought-out sacrifice. In this phase of his career, his characteristic conscientiousness was shown by the thoroughness and success with which he performed his military duties. He is a real loss to the regiment, wrote a senior officer. Everybody who knew him had a very high opinion of his military efficiency. As is so often the case, a quiet and reserved manner hid a brave heart. When it came to personal danger, he impressed men as being unconscious of it. I never met a man who displayed coolly more utter disregard for danger. And in this spirit he led his men against the enemy, and fell. From the last message that he gave the nurse for his people, tell them I'm all right. It is clear that he died with as quiet a mind and as surrendered a will as he lived. What we have lost who knew him, writes Mr. Glover, these lines may hint. I do not think we really know the extent of our loss. But we keep a great deal, a very great deal. Quid quid ex illo abamimus, quid quid mirati sumus manet mansurumque est. Yes, that is true. And from the first my sorrow, it may seem an odd confession, was for those who were not known to him, whose chance was lost, for the work he was not to do. For himself, if ever a man lived his life, it was he. Twenty-five or twenty-six years is not much, perhaps, as a rule, but here it was life and it was lived, to some purpose, it told, and it is not lost. PREFACE Then, said my friend, what is this war like? I ask you if it is this or that, and you shake your head. But you will not satisfy me with negatives. I want to know the truth. What is it like? There was a long silence. Express that silence. That is what we want to hear. The mask of glory, I said, has been stripped from the face of war. And we are fighting the better for that, continued my friend. You see that? I exclaimed. But of course you do. We know it, and you at home know it. And you want to know the truth? Of course, was the reply. I do not say that what you have read is not true, I said, but I do say that I have read nothing that gives a complete or proportioned picture. I have not yet found a perfect simile for this war, but the nearest I can think of is that of a pack of cards. Life in this war is a series of events so utterly different and disconnected that the effect upon the actor in the midst of them is like receiving a hand of cards from an invisible dealer. There are four suits in the pack. Spades represent the dullness, mud, weariness, and sordidness. Clubs stand for another side, the humour, the cheerfulness, the jollity, and good fellowship. In diamonds I see the glitter of excitement and adventure. Hearts are the tragic suit of agony, horror, and death. And to each man the invisible dealer gives a succession of cards. Sometimes they seem all black. Sometimes they are red and black alternately, and at times they come red, 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 and at the end is the ace of hearts. I understand, said my friend, and now tell me your hand. 
It was a long hand, I replied. I think I had better try and write it down in a book. I have never written a book. I wonder how it would pan out. At first my hand was chiefly black, with a sprinkling of diamonds. Later I received more diamonds, but the hearts began to come as well. At last the hearts seemed to be squeezing out the clubs and diamonds. There were always plenty of spades. There was another silence. There was one phrase, I resumed, in the daily communiques that used to strike us rather out there. It was, nothing of importance to record on the rest of the front. I believe that a hundred years hence this phrase will be repeated in the history books. There will be a passage like this. Save for the gigantic effort of Germany to break through the French lines at Verdun, nothing of importance occurred on the Western Front between September 1915 and the opening of the Somme offensive in the 1st of July 1916. And this will be believed, unless men have learned to read history aright by then. For the river of history is full of waterfalls that attract the day excursionist, such as battles and laws and the deaths of kings, whereas the spirit of the river is not in the waterfalls. There are men who were wounded in the Somme battle, who had only seen a few weeks of war. I have yet to see a waterfall, but I have learned something of the spirit of the deep river in eight months of nothing of importance. This, then, is the book that I have written. It is the spirit of the war as it came to me first in big incoherent impressions, later as a more intelligible whole. Perhaps it will seem that the first chapters are somewhat light in tone and inclined to gloss over the terrible side of war. But that is just what happens. At first the interest and adventure are paramount, and it is only after a time, only after all the novelty has worn away, that one gets the real proportion. If the first chapters do not bite deep, Remember that this was my experience. This book does not claim to be always sensational or thrilling. One claim only I make for it. From end to end, it is the truth. The events recorded are real and true in every detail. I have nowhere exaggerated, for in this war there is nothing more terrible than the truth. All the persons mentioned are also real, though I have thought it better to give them pseudonyms. January, 1917 End of Nothing of Importance and Preface Chapter One of Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Impressions Good-bye! Good-bye! Don't forget to send me that Hun helmet! All right! Goodbye. The train had long ago recovered from the shock of its initial jerk. A long, steady, grinding noise came up from the carriage wheels, as though they had recovered breath and were getting into their stride for Folkestone, regardless of the growing clatter of the southeastern rhythm. If, indeed, so noble a word may be used for the noise made by the wheels as they passed over the rail joints of this distinguished line. "'Don't believe it's a good thing having one's people to see you off,' said Terry, whose people had accompanied him in large numbers to Charing Cross. "'They will come, though,' remarked Crowley very wisely. "'I tried to persuade my people not to come,' said I. "'But they think you like it, I suppose. I would certainly rather say good-bye at home, and have no one come to the station.' And so I started off my experience of the great adventure, with a lie direct, but it does not weigh very heavily upon my conscience. Six of us sat in a first-class carriage on the morning of the 5th of October, 1915. For months we had been together in a reserve battalion, waiting to go out to the front, and now at last we had received marching orders, and were bound for Folkestone, and thence for France for which battalion of our regiment any or all of us twelve officers were destined, we had no knowledge whatever. But even the most uncongenial pair of us would, I am sure, have preferred each other's company to that of complete strangers. I, at any rate, 
have never in my life felt more shy and self-conscious and full of stupid qualms unless indeed it was on the occasion ten months before when i had stood shaking in front of a platoon of twenty men the last few days i had gone about feeling as though the news that i was going to the front were printed in large letters round my cap i felt that people in the railway carriages and in the streets were looking at me with an electric interest and the necessary and unnecessary purchases as well as the good-byes were of the kind to make one feel placed upon a pedestal of importance now in company with five other officers in like predicament i felt already that i had climbed down a step from that pedestal in fact the whole experience of the first few days was one of a steady reduction from all importance to complete insignificance as soon as we had recovered from the silence that followed my remarks upon the disadvantages of prolonged valedictions we commenced a critical survey of our various properties and accoutrements revolvers leapt from brand new holsters feet were held up to show the ideal trench nails flash lamps and torches compasses map cases pocket medicine cases all were shown with an easy confidence of manner that screened a sinking dread of disapprobation the prismatic compass was regarded rather as a joke by some of us its use in trench warfare was a doubtful quantity yet there were some of us who in the depths of our martial wisdom were half expecting that the battle of Luz was the prelude of an autumn campaign of open country warfare there was only one man whose word we took for law in anything and that was barrett he had spent five days in the trenches last december he had then received his commission in our battalion he was the man from the front and i noticed with secret misgivings that he had not removed the badges of rank from his arm or sewed his two stars upon his shoulder straps he had not removed his bright buttons and substituted for them leather ones such as are worn on golfing jackets and in his valise he told us he had his sam brown belt but you never wear sam browns out there i said all officers now dress as much as possible like the men that was so we were informed but officers used to wear them in billets when they were out of the firing line well said crowley we could get them sent out i expect yes said i i expect they would arrive safely but this infantile conversation is not worthy of record suffice to say we knew nothing about war and were just beginning to learn that fact the first check to our enthusiasm was at folkestone we reported to the railway transport officer whom we then regarded as a little demigod he told us to report in time for the boat at a certain hour this we did signed our names with a feeling of doing some awful and irrevocable deed and then were told to wait another three hours there was no room for us on this boat we retired to a hotel with a feeling that perhaps after all there was no such imperious shouting for our help over in france such as we had all i think save only barrett who was cynical and pessimistic secretly imagined darkness came ere we started the crossing did not seem long and i stood up on deck with barrett most of the time two destroyers followed a little astern one on either side and there were lights right across the channel we were picked out by searchlights more than once although all lights were forbidden on board i felt that i was now fair game for the germans and it was exciting to think that they would give anything to sink me at last i was in for the great adventure at boulogne we had to wait a long time on a dismal quay and in a drizzling rain to interview an irritated and sleepy railway transport officer after a long long queue had been safely negotiated we were given tickets to blank and then again we had to wait quite an hour on the platform some of our party were excited at their first visit to a foreign soil but their enthusiasm abated when at the buffet they were charged exorbitant prices and their english money was rejected as damn fool money 
Then there came a long jerky journey through the night in a crowded carriage. As I am out for confessions, I will here state that I did not think this could be an ordinary passenger train, and I wondered vaguely who these men and women were who got in and out of other carriages. At Etaple there was a still longer wait, and a still longer queue. But fortunately my signature had not lengthened. I remember sitting tired and dazed on the top of a valise, and asking Barrett what the time was. Three forty-five. What a time to arrive, I replied. But in war, three forty-five is as good a time as any other, I was soon to discover. We walked to a camp a mile distant from the station. Our arrival seemed quite unlooked for and a quartermaster sergeant had to be procured by the officer who was our guide in order to gain access to the tent that contained the blanket stores wearily at close on five o'clock we fell asleep on the boarded bottom of a bell tent it must have been about ten a m on the sixth when we turned out and found ourselves in a sandy country behind us was a small ridge crowned by a belt of fir trees the sun was well up and shone warm on the face as we washed and shaved in the open. The feeling of camp was exhilarating, and I was in good spirits. But two blows immediately damped my ardour most effectively. When I learned that I was posted to our first battalion, and I alone of all of us twelve, the thought of my arrival among the regulars, with no experience, and not even an acquaintance, far less a friend, was distinctly chilling. To add to my discomfiture, there befell a second misfortune. My valise nowhere to be seen. Indeed, the rest of the day was chiefly occupied in searching for my valise, but to no purpose whatever. I did not see it until ten days later, when by some miracle it appeared again. I can hardly convey the sense of depression these two facts cast over me the next few days. The interest and novelty of my experiences made me forget for short periods, but always there would return the thought of my arrival alone into a line regiment, and with the humiliating necessity of borrowing at once. Unknown and inexperienced I could not help being, but as a fool who lost all his property the first day, I should not cut a brilliant figure. We obtained breakfast at an estaminet by the station omelettes, rolls and butter, and café noir. I bought a French newspaper, and thought how finely my French would improve under this daily necessity. But I soon found that one could get the Paris edition of the Daily Mail, and my French is still as sketchy as ever. I remember watching the French children and the French women at the doors of the houses, and wondering what they thought of this war on their own soil. I knew that the wild enthusiasms of a year ago had died down. I did not expect the shouting and singing, the souvenir hunting, and the generous impulses that greeted our troops a year ago. But I felt so vividly myself the fact that between me and the Germans lay only a living wall of my own countrymen, that I could not help thinking, these urchins and women must feel it too. The very way in which they swept the doorsteps seemed to me worth noting at the moment. In the course of my wild peregrinations over the camp in search of my valise, I came upon a group of Tommies undergoing instruction in the machine-gun. Arrested by a familiar voice, I recognized as instructor a man I knew very well at Cambridge. He recognized me at the same moment, and in a few seconds we parted after an invitation from him to dinner that evening. He was on lines of communication work, he told me. Sitting in his tent after mess, I was amazed at the apparent permanence of his abode. Shelves made out of boxes, novels, an army list, magazines, maps, bed, washstand, candlesticks, a chair, baccy, and whiskey, and soda. It was all so snug and comfortable. I was soon to find myself accumulating a very similar collection in billets six miles behind the firing line, and taking most of it into the trenches. I remember being impressed by the statement that the cannonade had been heard day after day since the 25th, 
and still more impressed by references to the plans of the staff i left etable early on the morning of the seventh after receiving instructions and a railway warrant for chokwis from a one-armed major of the gordons of our original twelve only terry and crowley remained with me with a young scot we had a grey upholstered first-class carriage to ourselves in the train i commenced my first letter home i should here like to state that the reason for the inclusion in these first chapters of a good many extracts from letters is that they do really represent my first vague rather disconnected impressions and are therefore truer than any more coherent account i might now give first impressions of people houses places are always interesting i hope that the reader will not find these without interest even though he may find them at times lacking in style i am now on the train we are passing level crossings guarded by horn-blowing women the train is strolling leisurely along over grass-grown tracks and stopping at platformless stations it is very hot at midday i shall be about ten miles from the firing line and i expect the cannonade will be pretty audible i feel strangely indifferent to things now though i have the feeling that all this will be stamped indelibly on my memory how well i remember the thrill of excitement when i found the name shockwes on my map quite close to the firing line and as we got nearer and saw r a m c and cavalry camps and talked to tommies guarding the line saw aeroplanes and yes a captive balloon excitement grew still greater at last we reached chakwas and the railway transport officer calmly informed us that we had another four miles to go he brilliantly suggested walking but an A.S.C. lorry was there, and in we climbed, only to be ejected by the corporal. Eventually we tramped to Bethune with very full packs in a hot sun. Walking gave us opportunity for observation, and that road was worth seeing to those who had not seen it before. There were convoys of A.S.C. lorries drawn up, or parked, in twenties or thirties alongside the road each with its mystical marking a scarlet shell a green shamrock etc painted on its side red cross ambulances passed impelling one to turn back and look in them sometimes containing stretcher cases feet only visible or sitting cases with bandaged head or arm in sling then there were motor cars with staff officers motor cars with youthful officers in immaculate sam browns and slacks and as we drew near bethune we saw canteens with tommies standing and lounging outside small squads of men english notices and boards with painted inscriptions and in the distance loomed the square tower of the cathedral which i thought then to be a decapitated spire and so we came into the bustle of a french city i had never heard of bethune before as the crow flies it is about five to six miles from the front trenches the shops were doing a roaring trade and i was amazed to see chemists flaunting auto strop razors stationers offering tommy's writing pad and tailors showing english officers uniforms in their windows besides all the goods of a large and populous town we were very hungry and tired and fate directed us to the famous tea-shop where at dainty tables amid crowds of officers we obtained an english tea i was astounded so were we all to think that i had treasured a toothbrush as a thing that i might not be able to replace for months here was everything to hand were we really within six miles of the germans yet officers were discussing the hot time we had yesterday while we only came out this morning or they whiz-banged us pretty badly last night were remarks from officers redolent of bath and the hairdresser buttons brilliantly polished boots shining like advertisements swagger canes and immaculate collars gave the strangest first impression of active service to us with our leather equipment packs leather buttons and trench boots 
old barrett was right about the sam browns i said to terry vainly trying to look at my ease let's look at your map he answered then after a moment oh we're not far from the la basse canal i've heard of that often enough so have i i replied is la basse ours or theirs ours of course but he borrowed the map again to make sure refreshed but feeling strangely out of everything we eventually found our way to the town major here my letter continues i was told an orderly was coming in the evening to conduct me to the trenches to my battalion suddenly however we were told to go off seven of us in the same division to our brigades in a motor lorry so we are packed off i said good-bye to crowley and terry this was about 7 p.m. We went rattling along till within a short distance of our front trenches. There was a lot of cannonading going on around and behind us, and star shells bursting continuously, with Crystal Palace fireworks pops. We could hear rifles crackling, too. At length we got to where the lorry could go no further, and we halted for a long time where the houses were all ruins, and the roofs like spiders' webs with the white glare of the shells silhouetting them against the sky. The houses had been shelled yesterday, but last night no shells were coming our way at all. My feelings were exactly like they are in a storm. The nearer and bigger the flashes and bangs, the more I hoped the next would be really big and really near. Of course, all this cannonade was our artillery. At the time we were quite muddled up as to what it was the snarling bangs were the eighteen-pounders quite close to us about one thousand yards behind our front line the cracking bullets were spent bullets though it sounded to us as if they were from a trench about twenty yards in front of us nothing is more confusing at first than the different sounds of the different guns i think several of us would have been ready to say we had been under shell-fire that night the star shells should be more accurately described as flares or rockets but to continue my letter well the next few hours were a strange mixture of sensations we could nowhere find our brigades and after ten hours in the lorry we landed here at a place sixteen miles back from the firing line here our division had been located by a signaller whom we had consulted when we stopped by the crossroads we were left by the lorry at 5 a.m. at a field ambulance station close to H.Q., where we slept wearily till eight to awake and find ourselves miles from our division, which is really, I believe, quite near where we had been in the firing line. Now we are sitting in a big old chateau awaiting a telephone message. We are in a dining room, walls peeling, and armchairs reduced to legless deformities it is a jolly day sun and the smell of autumn i shall not forget that long ride i was at the back and could see out innumerable villages we passed innumerable mistakes we made innumerable stops innumerable inquiries but always there was the throbbing engine while we halted and the bump and rattle as we plunged through the night eight officers and seven valises i think we were one or two were reduced to grumbling several were asleep a few like myself were awake but all absolutely tired out it was too uncomfortable to rest cramped up among bulky valises and all sorts of sprawling limbs once at about four o'clock we halted at a house with a light in the window and found a miner just going off to work an old woman brewed some very black coffee and we hungrily devoured bits of bread and butter, coffee, and cognac, while the old woman, fat and smiling, gabbled incessantly at us. A strange, weird picture we must have made, some of us in kilts and bonnets, standing half awake in the flickering candlelight. We were at the chateau all morning. The R.A.M.C. fellows were very decent to us, gave us breakfast, eggs, bread and butter, and tinned jam and also lunch, bully beef, cheese, bread and butter, and beer. These were eaten off the dining-room table in style. I explored the chateau during the morning. 
just a big ordinary empty house inside outside it is white plaster with steep slate roofs and a few ornamental turrets the garden is mostly taken up with lines of picketed horses outside the orchards and enclosures the country is bare and flat it is a mining district and pyramids of slag stand up all over the plain i cannot do better than continue quoting from these first letters of mine of course i did not mention places by name well at two p m the same old lorry and corporal turned up and took us back to bethune i gather he got considerable strafing for last night's performance although i think he was not given clear enough instructions then with seven other officers we were sent off again in daylight and dropped by twos and threes at our various brigade headquarters our brigade h q was in one of the few houses left standing here i reported and was told that an orderly would take me to my battalion transport in half an hour the orderly arrived on a bicycle and by six p m i was only half a mile from our transport we were walking along when suddenly there was a scream like a rocket followed by a big bang and the sound of splinters falling all about i expected to see people jump into ditches but they stood calmly in the street women and all and watched while several shells whiz bangs i believe no dear innocents high explosive shrapnel burst just near the road about a hundred yards ahead we were four miles back from the firing line it was just the evening hate i expect it didn't last long just near us was one of our own batteries firing intermittently this was my first experience being under fire i hadn't the least idea what to do the textbooks i believe said throw yourself on the ground i therefore looked at my orderly but he was ducking behind his bicycle which i am sure is not recommended by any manual of military training i ducked behind nothing copying him this all took place in the middle of the road when i saw women opening the doors of their houses and standing calmly looking at the shells ducking seemed out of the question so we both stood and watched the bursting shells then the salvo ceased and i thinking i must show some sort of a lead suggested that we should proceed but my orderly wiser by experience suggested waiting to see if another salvo were forthcoming after ten minutes however it was clear that the germans had finished and we resumed our journey in peace my letter continues at the transport i had a very comfortable billet the quartermaster and two other new officers and myself had supper in an upstairs room the quartermaster seemed very pessimistic and told us a lot about our losses we turned in at ten o'clock and i slept well it was very quiet that is to say only intermittent bangs such as have continued ever since the beginning of the war and will continue to the end thereof october ninth this morning a cart took us at nine o'clock to within about a mile of the firing line putting us down at the corner of a street that has been renamed h street the country was dead flat the houses everywhere in ruins though some were untouched and still inhabited thence an orderly conducted us to h q where we reported to the adjutant and the c o who is quite young by the way they were in the ground floor room of a house to which we came all the way from h street along a communication trench about seven feet deep these trenches were originally dug by the french i believe i was told i was posted to d company so another orderly took me back practically to h street which must be six or seven hundred yards behind the firing line d is in reserve i am attached to it for the present there are two other officers in it davidson and simons both have only just joined so at last i was fairly lodged in my battalion i had been directed dumped shaken and carried in a kindly yet to me most amazingly haphazard way to my destination and there i found myself quite unexpected but immediately attached somewhere until i should sort myself out a little and find my feet i had a servant called smith 
in the afternoon i went with davidson to supervise a working party which was engaged in paving a communication trench with tiles from the neighbouring houses in the evening i set to and wrote letters i will close this chapter with yet one more quotation now i am in the ground floor of one of the few standing houses in h street next door is a big ecole des filles which i am quite surprised to find empty really the way the people go about their work here is amazing still i suppose to carry on a girls school half a mile from the bosch is just beyond the capacity of even their indifference i've already got quite used to the noise there are two guns just about forty yards away that keep on firing with a terrific bang i can see the flashes just behind me i think the noise would worry you if you heard these blaring bangs at the end of the back garden which is just about the distance this battery is from me we are messing here in this room half a table has been propped up and three chairs discovered and patched up for us all the windows facing the enemy have been blocked up with sandbags i sleep here to-night if the house is shelled i shall flee to the dugout twenty yards away orders have not yet come but i believe we go back to billets to-morrow a free issue of glory boys cigarettes has just arrived two packets for each officer and man please don't forget to send my sam brown belt end of chapter one chapter two of nothing of importance by bernard adams this librivox recording is in the public domain Kianchi and Givenchy. Throughout October and November our battalion was in the firing line. This meant that we spent life in an everlasting alternation between the trenches and our billets behind, just far enough behind, that is, to be out of the range of the light artillery. Always, though, liable to be called suddenly into the firing line, and never out of the atmosphere of the trenches. Always before us, was dangled a promised rest, and always it was being postponed. Rumours were spread, dissected, laughed at, and eventually treated with bored incredulity. The battalion had had no rest, I believe, since May. Men, and especially NCOs, who had been out since October 1914, were tired out in body and spirit. With the officers and certain new drafts of men it was different we came out enthusiastic and keen on the whole i thoroughly enjoyed those first two months i am surprised now to see how much detail i wrote in my letters home everything was fresh everything new and interesting and things were on the whole very quiet we had a few casualties but underwent no serious bombardment and most important to us of course we had no casualties among the officers Givenchy and Kionchy are two small villages, north and south respectively, of the La Bassie Canal, which runs almost due east and west between La Bassie and Bethune. Givenchy stands on a slight rise in the flattest of flat countries. A church tower of red brick must have been the most noticeable feature as one walked in pre-war days from the suburbs of Bethune along the Bassie Road. Kyoshi is a village straggling along a road. Both are as completely reduced to ruins as villages can be, the firing line running just east of them. Between them flows the great sluggish canal. During an afternoon in Bethune, one could do all the shopping one required, and get a haircut and shampoo as well. Expensive cocktails were obtained at the local bar. There was also a famous tea shop we were billeted in one of the small villages around sometimes we only stayed one night at a billet there was always change always movement sometimes i got a bed often i did not but a valise is comfortable enough when once its tricks are mastered anyhow it is billets and not trenches that is the point a continuous night's rest in pyjamas the facilities of a bath very often a free afternoon and evening and no equipment and revolver to carry night and day. It was in billets the following letters were written, 
which are really the best description of my life at this period. 19th October, 1915 Our battalion went into the trenches on the 14th and came out on the 17th. Our company, B, was in support. The front line was about 300 yards ahead, and we held the second line, everything prepared to meet an attack in case the enemy broke through the first line. Halfway between our first and second lines was a kind of redoubt, to be held at all costs. For three days and nights I was in command of this redoubt, isolated and ready with stores, ammunition, water, barbed wire and pickets, bombs and tools, to hold out a little siege for several days if necessary. I used to leave it to get meals at Company HQ, in the support line. Otherwise I had always to be there, ready for instant action. No one used to get more than two or three hours consecutive sleep, and I could never take off boots, equipment, or revolver. Here is a typical scene in the redoubt. Scene. A dugout. Six feet by four feet by four feet. Smell. Earthy. Time. 2.30 a.m. I awake and listen. Deathly stillness. A voice. What's the time, kid? Another voice. Dunno. About two o'clock, I reckon. Past that. Long silence. Rum job this is, ain't it, kid? Why? Well, I reckon if the damn Huns were coming over, we'd know it long before they got here. I reckon we'd hear the boys in front firing. Long pause. I dunno. Suppose there's some sense in it, else we wouldn't be here. Silence. Damn cold on this damn fire step. Guess it's time they relieved us. Long silence. Don't them flares look funny in the mist? Yes, I guess old Fritz uses some of them every night. Hullo, there they go again. Hear that machine gun? Long pause, during which machine guns pop, and snipers snipe merrily, and flares light up the sky. Trench mortars begin behind us. Whish! Silence. Thud. Then the Germans reply, sending two or three over which thud harmlessly behind. The invisible sentries have now become clearly visible to me as I look out of my dugout. Two of them are about ten yards apart, standing on the fire platform. Theirs is the above dialogue. With a sudden thud, a trench mortar shell drops fifteen yards behind us. Hello! Fritz is getting the wind up. Getting the wind up? is slang for getting nervous. This stolid comment from a sentry is typical of the attitude adopted towards Fritz, the German, when he starts shelling or finding. He is supposed to be a bit jumpy. It seems hard to realize that Fritz is really trying to kill these sentries. The whole thing seems a weird, strange play. I make an effort and crawl out of the dugout. The strafing has died down. Only occasional flares climb up from the German lines, and pop, pop, in the morning mist. I go round the sentries, standing up by them and looking over the parapet. It is cold and raw, and the sentries are looking forward to the next relief. Ah, there is the corporal on trench duty coming. I can hear him routing out the snoring relief. Ping! goes a stray bullet singing by, a ricochet by its sound. A near one, sir! yes evans safer in the front line i guess it is sir then the sentries changed i turned back again to my dugout sleeping with revolvers and equipment requires some care of position half past four sir comes after a pause and some sleep out i get and everybody stands to arms for an hour each man taking up the position allotted to him along the fire platform Gradually it gets light. Some brick stacks grow out of the mist in front, and ruined cottages loom up in the rear, and what was a church. The fire platform being here pretty high, one can look back over the parados, over bare flat country, cut up by trenches, and run to waste terribly. Parados, by the way, is the name given to the back of a trench. At five-thirty, stand down and clean rifles, is the order given and the cleaning commences, a process as oft-repeated as washing up in civilized lands. 
and as monotonous and unsatisfactory, for a few hours later the rifles are a bit rusty and muddy again, and need another inspection. 7.30. Tell Sergeant Summers I'm going down to company headquarters. Very good, sir. Then I take a long, mazy journey down the communication trench, which is six feet deep at least, and mostly paved with bricks from a neighbouring brickfield. There are an amazing lot of mice about the trenches, and they fall in and can't get out. Most of them get squashed. Frogs, too, which make a green and worse mess than the mice. Our CO always stops and throws a frog out if he meets one. Tommy, needless to say, is not so sentimental. These trenches have been built a long time, and grass stalks, dried scabious, and plantain stalks grow over the edges, which must make them very invisible from above. H Street, L Lane, C Road, P Lane are traversed, and so into S Street, where, in the cellar of what was once a house, are two hungry officers already started on bacon and eggs, coffee, with condensed milk, and bread and tinned jam. We are lucky with three chairs and a table. A newspaper makes an admirable tablecloth, and a bottle a good candlestick, and there is room in a cellar to stand up. Breakfast done, a shave is manipulated, Meadows, my servant, getting ready my tackle and producing a mug of hot water. 9.30 finds me back in the redoubt and starting a working party on repairing a communication trench and generally improving the trenches. Working parties are unpopular. Tommy does not believe in improving trenches he may never see again. And so the day goes on. Sentries change and take their place, sitting gazing into a scrap of mirror. Ration parties come up, with Dixies carried on wooden pickets, and the pioneer generally cleans up, sprinkling chloride of lime about in white showers, which seems as plentiful as the sand of the seashore, and the odour of which clings to the trenches, as the smell of seaweed does to the beach. The redoubt was in the Quanchy trenches, and that old cellar was really a delightful headquarters. The first time we were in it we found a cat there. On the second occasion the same cat appeared with three lusty kittens. These used to keep the place clear of rats, and get sat on every half hour or so. I soon learned to get used to smoke. On one occasion the smoke from our brazier became so thick that Gray, the cook, threatened to resign. For all the smoke gathers at the top of a dugout, and seems impossibly suffocating to anyone first entering. Yet it is often practically clear two or three feet from the ground, so that when lying or sitting one does not notice the smoke at all. But a newcomer gets his eyes so stung that it seems impossible that anyone can live in the dugout at all. Gray, by the way, was not allowed to resign. Here follows a letter describing the front trenches at Givenchy. 7th November. On the 29th we marched off at nine and halted at eleven for dinner. Luckily it was fine, and the piled arms, the steaming dixies, and the groups of men sitting about, eating and smoking, formed a pleasant sight. Our grub was put by mistake on the mess cart, which went straight on to the trenches. Edwards, however, our company mess president, came up to the scratch with bread, butter, and eggs. Tea was easily procured from the cookers. Then off we went to our HQ. There we got down into the communication trench, and in single file were taken by guides into our part of the trenches. These guides were sent by the battalion we were relieving. I told you that all the trenches have names, which are painted on boards hung up at the trench corners. The first thing done was to post sentries along our company front. Until this was done, the outgoing battalion could not outgo. Each man has his firing position allotted to him, and he always occupies it at stand to and stand down. We were three days and three nights in the trenches. Each officer was on duty for eight hours, during which he was responsible for a sector of firing line and must be actually in the front trench. My watch was twelve to four, a.m. and p.m. Work that out with stand two in the morning and also in the evening, 
and you will see that consecutive sleep is not easy. On paper, six to twelve, midnight, looks good. But then, remember, dinner at seven or seven-thirty, according to the fire, while you may have to turn out any time if you are being shelled at all. For instance, one night, I was just turning in early at seven, when a mine went up on our right, and shelling and general strafing kept me out till nine-thirty, after which I couldn't sleep. So at midnight I was tired when I started my four hours, turning in at four, out again for stand to, eight, breakfast, nine, rifle inspection, and so it goes on. This is why you can appreciate billets, and bed from nine to seven if you want it. Imagine a cold November night, with a ground fog. What bliss to be roused from a snug dugout at midnight, and patrol the company's line for four interminable hours. It is deathly quiet. Has the war stopped? I stand up on the fire-step beside the sentry, and try to see through the fog. Pip-pip, pip-pip-pip, goes a machine-gun. So the war's still on. Cold? I ask a sentry. Only me feet, sir. Why don't you stamp your feet, then? This being equivalent to an order, Tommy stamps feebly a few times, until made to do so energetically. Unless you make him stamp, he will not stamp. Would infinitely prefer to let his feet get cold as ice. Of course, when you have gone into the next bay, he immediately stops. Still, that is Tommy. I gaze across into no man's land. I can just see our wire, and in front a collection of old tins, bully tins, jam tins, butter tins, paper, old bits of equipment. Other regiments always leave places so untidy. You clean up, but when you come into trenches you find the other fellows have left things about. You work hard repairing the trenches. The relieving regiment, you find on your return, has done damn all which is military slang for nothing. And all other regiments, it seems, have the same complaint. Swish! A German flare rocket lights up everything. You see our trenches all along. Everything is as clear as day. You feel as conspicuous as a cromlech on a hill. But the enemy can't see you, fog or no fog, if you only keep still. The light has fallen on the parapet this time and lies sizzling on the sandbags. A flicker and it is gone. And in the fog you see black blobs, the size and shape of the dazzling light you've just been staring at. Crack! Plop! Crack! Plop! A couple of bullets bury themselves in the sandbags, or else, with a long-drawn ping, go singing over the top. Why the sentries never get hit seems extraordinary. I suppose a mathematician would by combination and permutation tell you the chances against bullets aimed at a venture, hitting sentries exposing one-fourth of their persons at a given elevation at so many paces interval. Personally, I won't try, as my whole object is to keep awake till four o'clock, and then I shall be too sleepy. Only remember, it is night, and the sentries are invisible. Tap, tap, tap. There's a wiring party out, sir. I've heard em these last five minutes. Undoubtedly there are a few men out in no man's land, repairing their wire. I tell the sentries near to look out and be ready to fire, and then I send off a very flare, fired by a thick cartridge from a thick-barrelled brass pistol. It makes a good row, and has a fair kick, so it is best to rest the butt on the parapet and hold it at arm's length. Even so, it leaves your ears singing for hours. The first shot was a failure, only a miserable rocket tail which failed to burst. The second was a magnificent shot. It burst beautifully, and fell right behind the party, two Germans, and silhouetted them, falling and burning still incandescent on the ground behind. A volley of fire followed from our waiting sentries. I could not see if the party were hit. Most of the shots were fired after the light had died out. Anyhow, the working party stopped. The two figures stood quite motionless while the flare burned. The Germans opposite us were very lively. One could often hear them whistling, and one night they were shouting to one another like anything. 
They were Saxons, who are always at that game. No one knows exactly what it means. It was quite cold, almost frosty, and the sound came across the hundred yards or so of no man's land with a strange clearness in the night air. The voices seemed unnaturally near, like voices on the water heard from a cliff. Tommy, Tommy, Allemands bon, English bon, we hate the grand prince. I can hear how the nasal twang with which the grand was emphasized. Damn the Kaiser! Deutschland unter alles! I could hear these shouts almost distinctly. The same sentences were repeated again and again. They shouted to one another from one part of the line to another, generally preceding each sentence by, Kamerad! Often you hear loud hearty laughter, as comic cuts, the name given to the daily intelligence reports, sagely remarked. Either this means that there is a spirit of dissatisfaction among the Saxons, or it is a ruse to try and catch us unawares, or it is mere foolery, wisdom in high places. Really, it was intensely interesting. "'Come over!' shouted Tommy. "'We are not coming over!' came back. Loud clapping and laughter followed remarks like, "'We hate the Grand Prince!' Then they would yodel and sing like anything. Tommy replied with Tipperary. They sang, God save the king, or rather their German equivalent of it, to the familiar tune. Then, Abide with us, rose into the night air and starlight. This went on for an hour and a half, though almost any night you can hear them shout something and give a yodel. It is the strangest thing I have ever experienced. The authorities now try and stop our fellows answering. The entente of last Christmas is not to be repeated. One of the officers in our battalion has shown me several German signatures on his paybook. He was in the ranks then. Given in friendly exchange, in the middle of no man's land last Christmas day. I have had my baptism of mud now. It tires me to think of it, and I have not the effort to write fully about it. The second time we were in these trenches, the mud was two feet deep. Even our company headquarters, a cellar, was covered with mud and slime. Parados's and communication trenches had fallen in, and the going was terrible. The sticky mud yoiked one's boots off nearly, and it felt as if one's foot would be broken in extricating it. We all wore gum boots of blue-black rubber that came right up to the waist like fishermen's waders. But the mud is everywhere, and we get our arms all plastered with it as we literally reel to and fro along the trench, every now and again steadying ourselves against slimy sandbags. One or two men actually got stuck, and had to be helped out with spades. One fellow lost heart and left one of his gum boots stuck in the mud, and turned up in my platoon in a stockinged foot, of course plastered thick with clay. We worked day and night. Gradually the problem is being tackled. Weariness. Mud. The next experience, not mentioned in my letter, was death. On our immediate right was C Company. Here our trench runs out like an inverted V, more or less, and the opposite trenches are very close together. Consequently, it is a great place for mining activity. One evening we put up a mine. The next afternoon the Germans put up a countermine, and accompanied it with a hail of trench mortars. I was on trench duty at the time, and had ample opportunity of observing the genus trench mortar and its habits. One can see them approaching some time before they actually fall, as they come from a great height, in military terms, with a steep trajectory, and one can see them revolving as they topple down. Then they fall with a thud, and black smoke comes up and mud spatters all about. Most of them were falling in our second line and support trenches. I was patrolling up and down our front trench. We were standing too after the mine, and for half an hour it was rather a hot shop. I was delighted to find that I rather enjoyed it, seeing one or two of the new draft, with the wind up, a bit steadied me at once. I have hardly ever since 
felt the slightest nervousness under fire. It is mainly temperament. Our company had four casualties, one in the front trench, the three others in the platoon in support. C Company suffered more heavily. At six, Edwards came on duty, and I was able to go in quest of two bombers who were said to be wounded. Getting near the place, I came on a man standing half-dazed in the trench. "'Oh, sir!' he cried, in burring speech of a true Welshman. "'A trench mortar has fallen in a rick into me duck-out. For the moment I felt like laughing at the man's curious speech and look, but I saw that he was greatly scared, and no wonder. A trench mortar had dropped right into the mouth of his dugout, and had half buried two of his comrades. We were soon engaged in extricating them. Both had bad head wounds, and how he escaped is a miracle. I helped carry the two men out, and over the debris of flattened trenches to company headquarters. So, for the first time, I looked upon two dying men, and some of their blood was on my clothes. One died in half an hour, the other early next morning. It was really not my job to assist. The stretcher-bearers were better at it than I. Yet in this first little bit of strafe I was carried away by my instinct, whereas later I should have been attending to the living members of my platoon and the defence of my sector. I left the company sergeant-major in difficulties as to whether Randall, the man who had so miraculously escaped, and who was temporarily dazed, should be returned as sick or wounded. Another death that came into my close experience was that of a lance-corporal in my platoon. I had only spoken to him a quarter of an hour before, and on returning found him lying dead on the fire platform. He had been killed instantaneously by a rifle grenade. I lifted the waterproof sheet and looked at him. I remember that I was moved, but there was nothing repulsive about his recumbent figure. I think the novelty and interest of these first casualties made them quite easy to bear. I was so busy noticing details, the silence that reigned for a few hours in my platoon, the details of removing the bodies, the collecting of kit, etc. These things at first blunted my perception of the vileness of the tragedy, nor did I feel the cruelty of war as I did later weariness mud death so it was with great joy that we would return to billets to get dry and clean to eat sleep and write letters to drill and carry out inspections company drill bayonet fighting gas helmet drill musketry and lectures were usually confined to the morning and early afternoon we thought that we had rather an overdose of lecturing from our medical officer the m o on sanitation and the care of the feet trench feet one lecture always began is that state produced by excessive cold or long standing in water or liquid mud we soon got to know too much we felt about the use of whale oil and anti-frostbite grease the changing of socks and the rubbing and stamping of feet we did get rather fed up with it yet i believe we had only one case of trench feet in our battalion throughout the winter so perhaps it was worth our discomfort of attending so many lectures. Our C.O.'s lectures on trench warfare were always worth hearing. He was so tremendously keen and such a perfect and whole-hearted soldier. A chapter might be written on billet life. Here are a few more extracts from letters. October 13th. All day long this little inn has shaken from top to bottom. There is one battery about a hundred yards away that makes the whole house rattle like the inside of a motor-bus. The Germans might any time try and locate the battery, and a shell would reduce the house to ruins. Yet the old woman here declares she will not leave the house as long as she lives. It is a strange place, this belt of land behind the firing line. The men are out of the trenches for three days, and it is their duty, after perhaps a running parade before breakfast, and two or three hours' drill and inspection in the morning, to rest for the remainder of the day. In the morning you will see all the evolutions of company drill carried out in a small meadow behind a strip of woodland. 
in the next field an old man and woman are unconcernedly hoeing a cabbage patch then behind here are a battalion's transport lines with rows of horses picketed along the road an a s c convoy is passing each lorry at regulation distance from the next in the afternoon you will see groups of tommies doing nothing most religiously smoking cigarettes writing letters home from six to eight the estaminets are open and every one flocks to them to get bad beer they are also open an hour at midday and then the orderly officer accompanied by the provost sergeant produces an electric silence with any complaints it does not pay an estaminet keeper to dilute his beer too much or else he will lose his license i often wonder if these peasants think much think they must have done at the beginning when their men were hastily called up but now after fifteen months of war it is the children chiefly who are interested in the aeroplanes shining like eagles silver white against the blue sky or in the boom from the battery across the street but for their mothers and grandparents these things have settled into their lives they are all one with the canal and the poplar trees if a squad starts drilling on their lettuces they are tremendously alert but as for these other things they are not interested only unutterably tired of them and after a while you adopt the same attitude the noise of the guns is boring and you hardly look up at an aeroplane unless it is shrapneled by the archies anti-aircraft guns then it is worth watching the pinprick flashes dotting the sky all around it leaving little white curls of smoke floating in the blue that billet was close to the firing line here is a letter from a village eight miles back twentieth october nineteen fifteen we came out here on monday the whole division marched out together it was really an impressive sight over a mile of troops on the march perfect order perfect arrangement where the road bent you could often see the column for a mile in front a great snake curling along the right side of the road occasionally an adjutant would break out of the line to trot back and correct some straggling or a c o would emerge for a gallop over the adjacent plough land our company is billeted in a big prosperous farm the men are in a roomy barn and look very comfortable we are in a big room on the right as you enter the front door of the farm on a tiled floor stands a round table with an oilcloth cover originally of a bright red pattern but now subdued by constant scrubbings to the palest pink with occasional scarlet dottings there are big tall windows a wardrobe and sideboard a big chimney place fitted with a coke stove and on the walls hang three very dirty old prints the only war touch beside our scattered possessions is a picture from a french illustrated of le son de Verme outside is a yard animated by cows turkeys geese chicken and ducks also a donkey and a peacock not to mention the usual dogs and cats at five a m i am awakened by an amazing chorus the patron is a strong competent man with many fine buxom daughters who do the farm work with great capacity and energy henriette with a pitchfork is strength and grace in action tommy is much in awe of her she hustles the pigs relentlessly the sons are at the war etienne and marcel aged ten and eight respectively complete the family with madame of course who makes inimitable coffee and various grandparents who appear in white caps and cook and bake all day i have just paid out all in five and twenty franc notes in the field every man has his own pay-book which the officer must sign while the company quartermaster sergeant sees that his acquittance roll is also signed by tommy we had a small table and chair out in the yard and in an atmosphere of pigs and poultry i dealt out the blue and white oblongs which have already in many cases been converted into bread for that is where most of the pay money goes there and in the estaminets the bread ration is always small the biscuit ration overflowing 
Bully beef, by the way, is simply ordinary corned beef. I watched cooking operations yesterday, and saw some fifty tins cut in half with an axe, clean hewn asunder, and the meat deftly hoiked with a fork into the field kitchen, or cooker, which is a range and boiler on wheels. This was converted into a big stew, and served out into Dixie's, camp kettles, and so to the men's canteens. This afternoon our company practised an attack over open country. I was surprised to find the men so well trained. I had imagined that prolonged trench warfare would have made them stale. The country is very flat. There are no hedges. The only un-English characteristics are the poplar rows, the dried beans tied round poles like Mother Gamp umbrellas, and the wayside chapels and crucifixes. Yesterday afternoon Edwards and I got in a little revolver practice just near, and afterwards we had an energetic game of hockey, with sticks and an empty cartridge case. Altogether billet life was very enjoyable. On November 1st, Captain Dixon joined our battalion and took over B Company. For over four months I worked under the most good-natured and popular officer in the battalion. We were always in good spirits while he was with us. I can't think why it is, he used to say, I'm not at all a jolly person, yet you fellows are always laughing, and in my old regiment it was always the same. He was a fearful pessimist, but a fine soldier. His delight used to be to get a good fire blazing in billets, sit in front of it with a novel, and then deliver a tirade against the discomfort of war. The great occasion used to be when the arch-pessimist, our quartermaster, was invited to dinner. Then Edwards, the mess-president, would produce endless courses, and the two pessimists would warm to a delightful duologue on the fatuity of the staff, the army, and the government. "'By Jove, we are the biggest fools on this earth,' Dixon would say at last. "'We're fools enough to be led by fools,' Jim Potter would reply. And somehow we were all more cheerful than ever. End of chapter 2 Chapter Three of Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Working Parties Fall in the Brick Party! The six privates awoke from a state of inert dreaming, or lolling against the barn that flanked the gateway of battalion headquarters, to stand in two rows of three and await orders. At last the ASC lorry had turned up an hour late and while it turned round I dispatched one of the privates to our transport to get six sandbags. By the time he returned the lorry had performed its about-wheel, and all aboard, myself in front and the six behind, we are off for C. We pass through Bethune. As we approach through the suburbs, we rattle past motor dispatch riders, ASC lorries, Red Cross carts, columns of transport horses being exercised, officers on horseback, officers in motor-cars, small unarmed fatigue parties, battalions on the march. Then there are carts carrying bricks, French postmen on bicycles, French navvies in blue uniforms repairing the road, innumerable peasant traps, coal wagons, women with baskets, and children of course everywhere business as usual, yet, but for a line of men not so many miles away, the place would be a desolate ruin like the towns and villages that chance has doomed to be in the firing line. So I moralize, not so the Tommies, sprawling behind, inside the lorry, and caring not a jot for anything save that they are on a cushy or soft job, as the rest of the battalion are doing four hours digging under R.E. supervision. A good thing to be a Tommy, to be told to fall in here or there, and not to know whether it is for a bayonet charge or a job of carting earth. Bang! 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 We are nearing the firing line, having left Bethune, where military police stand at every corner directing the traffic with flags, one road up, another down. 
we are once more within the noisy but invisible chain of batteries lorries six miles per hour the shell holes in the road roughly filled with stones would make quicker going impossible anyhow we are entering c and i keep an eagle eye open for ruined houses and soon stop by a house with two walls and half a roof out come the six tommies and proceed to fill a sandbag each with bricks and empty it into the lorry the supply is inexhaustible and in half an hour the a s c corporal refuses to take more declaring we have the regulation three-ton load so i stop work and prepare to depart the corporal however has heard of a sister lorry near by which has unfortunately slipped into a ditch and so to speak sprained its ankle though extraordinarily unromantic in appearance the corporal shows himself imbued with a spirit of knight errantry and having obtained my permission to rescue the fair damsel sets off for what he declares cannot take more than ten minutes as i thought the process would take probably more like twenty minutes i let the men repair to a house on the opposite side of the road where was a rather more undamaged piece of roof than usual it was now raining and myself explored the place i happened to be in occasionally at home one comes across a deserted cottage in the country a most desolate spirit pervades the place imagine then what it is like in these villages half a mile or a mile behind what has become the firing line for now twelve months a few steps off the main road brought me into what had formerly been a small garden belonging to a farm there had been a red brick wall all along the north side with fruit trees trained along it now the wall was mostly a rubble heap and the fruit trees dead one sickly pear tree struggled to exist in a crumbled sort of heap but its wilted leaves only added to the desolation of the scene an iron gate between red brick pillars was still standing strangely enough but the little lawn was run to waste and had a crater in the middle of it about five feet across inside of which was some disintegrating animal also empty tins and other refuse trees were broken weeds were everywhere i tried to reconstruct the place in my imagination but it was a chaotic tangle i came across a few belated raspberries and picked one or two they were tasteless and watery rubbish and broken glass were strewn everywhere it was a dreary sight in the grey rain the only sign of life a few chattering blue tits the house was an utter ruin only a ground-room wall left standing some of the outhouses had not suffered so much but all the roofs were gone i saw a rusty mangle staring forlornly out of a heap of debris and a manger and hay-rack showed what had been a stable the pond was just near too and gradually i could piece together the various elements of the farm who the owners were i vaguely wondered perhaps they will return after the war but i doubt if they could make much of the old ruins these villages will most likely remain a blighted area for years like the villages reclaimed by the jungle already the virginia creeper and woodbine are trying to cover the ugliness the tommies meanwhile had been smoking gold flakes and one or two had also been exploring one had discovered a child's elementary botany book and was studying the illustrations when i came up our combined view now was where is the lorry and this view held the field with increasing curiosity annoyance and vituperation for one solid hour and a half it was dinner-time and a common bond of hunger held us until at last in exasperation i marched half the party in quest of our errant conveyance i was thoroughly annoyed with the gallant corporal three-quarters of a mile away i found the two lorries my little corporal had rescued his lorn princess but she being a buxom wench had brought her rescuer into like predicament and so we came up just in time to see the rescue of our lorry from the treacherous ditch i felt i could not curse especially as the little corporal had winded himself somehow in the stomach during the last bout it had been a feeble show yet there was the lorry and in it the bricks on to which the fellows climbed deliberately as men who recover a lost prize 
and so we arrived at our transport. The bricks were for a horse stand in a muddy yard. At half past two. After which I dismissed the party to its belated dinner. The above incident hardly deserves a place in a chapter headed Working Parties, being in almost every respect different from any other I have ever conducted. I think the working party is realized less than anything else in this war by those who have not been at the front. It does not appeal to the imagination, yet it is essential to realize, if one wants to know what this war is like, the amount of sheer dogged labor performed by the infantry in digging, draining, and improving trenches. The working party usually consists of seventy to a hundred men from a company with either one or two officers. The brigadier going round the trenches finds a communication trench falling in, and about a foot of mud at the bottom. Get a working party on to this at once, he says to his staff captain. The staff captain consults one of the R.E. officers, and a note is sent to the adjutant of one of the two battalions in billets. Your battalion will provide a working party of blank officers, blank full ranks, sergeants and corporals, and blank other ranks to-morrow. Report to Lieutenant blank, R.E., at blank, at 5 p.m., to-morrow, for work on blank trench. Tools will be provided. The staff captain then dismisses the matter from his head. The adjutant then sends the same note to one or more of the four company commanders, detailing the number of men to be sent by the companies specified by him. He is scrupulously careful to divide work equally between the companies, by the way. The company commander, on receiving the note, curses volubly, declares it a damned shame the hardest-worked battalion in the brigade can't be allowed a moment's rest, feels sure the men will mutiny one of these days, etc., summons the orderly, who is frousting in the next room with the officer's servants, and says, Take this to the sergeant-major after scribbling on the note, parade outside Company HQ, 3.30 p.m., and adding, as the orderly departs, might tell the quartermaster sergeant I want to see him. Meanwhile, the three subalterns are extraordinarily engrossed in their various occupations, until the company commander boldly states that it is rotten luck, but he supposes as so-and-so took the last, it is so-and-so's turn, isn't it? and details the officers. If they are new officers, he tells them the sergeants will know exactly what to do, and if they are old hands, he tells them nothing whatever. The quarter, company quarter master sergeant, then arrives, and is told the party will not be back, probably, till 10 p.m., and will he make sure, please, that hot soup is ready for the men on return, and also dry socks, if it turns out wet. He is then given a drink, and the company commander's work is finished. Meanwhile the company sergeant-major has received the orders from the orderly, and summons unto him the orderly sergeant, and from his roster, or roll, ticks off the men and NCOs to be warned for the working party. This the orderly sergeant does by going round to the various barns and personally reading out each man's name, and on getting the answer saying, you're for the working party, 3.15 today. The exact nature of the remarks when he is gone are beyond my province. Only, as an officer taking the party, one knows that at 3.25 p.m. the senior sergeant calls the two lines of waiting other ranks to attention, and with a slap on his rifle announces, Working party present, sir, as you stroll up. Working parties are dressed in musketry order, usually, that is to say, with equipment, but no packs. Rifles and ammunition, of course, and waterproof sheets rolled and fastened to the webbing belt. The officer then tells the sergeant to stand them easy, while he asks one or two questions, and looks once more at orders which the senior sergeant has probably brought on parade, and at 3.30, with a company shun slope hip right in fours form fours right by the right quick march leads off his party giving march at ease march easy almost in one breath 
as soon as he rounds the corner. Then there is a hitching of rifles to the favourite position, and a buzz of remarks and whistles and song behind, while the sergeant edges up to the officer, or the officer edges back to the sergeant, according to their degree of intimacy, and the working party is on its way. One working party I remember very well. We were in billets at blank, and really tired out. It was November 6th, and on looking up my letters I find our movements for the last week had been as follows. October 29th, 9 a.m., moved off from billets, 12 midday, lunch, 3 p.m., arrived in front trenches, October 30th, front trenches, October 31st, front trenches, November 1st, relieved at 3 p.m., the Devons were very late relieving us, owing to bad rain and mud. 5.30 p.m. reached billets. November 2nd, rain all day, morning spent by men in trying to clean up, afternoon, baths. November 3rd, 9 a.m., started off for trenches again, it had rained incessantly, mud terrible. 1 p.m., arrived in front trenches. November 4th, front trenches rained all day. November 5th, 2.30 p.m., relieved late again. Mud colossal, billets 5 p.m. November 6th, morning, clean-up, inspection by C.O. Afternoon, sudden and unexpected working party, 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Yet I thoroughly enjoyed those eight hours, I remember. There were, I suppose, about eighty N.C.O.s and men from B Company. I was in charge, with one other officer. We halted at a place whither the cooker had been previously dispatched, and where the men had their tea. Luckily it was fine. The men sat about on lumps of trench boards and coils of barbed wire, for the place was an R.E. dump, where a large accumulation of R.E. stores of all description was to be found. I apologised to the R.E. officer for keeping him a few minutes while the men finished their tea. He, however, a second lieutenant, was in no hurry whatever, it seemed, and waited about a quarter of an hour for us. Then I fell the men in, and then they drew tools, so many men a pick, so many a shovel, the usual proportion is one pick, two shovels, and we splodged along through whitish clay of the stickiest calibre in the gathering twilight. An R.E. corporal and two R.E. privates had joined us mysteriously by now, as well as the second lieutenant, and crossing H Street, we plunged down into a communication trench, and started the long mazy grope. The R.E. corporal was guide. The trench was all paved with trench mats, but these were not laid, only shoved down anyhow. Consequently they wobbled, and one's boot slipped off the side into squelch, rubbing the ankle. Continually came up the message from behind, "'Lost touch, sir!' This involved a wait, one, two minutes, until the "'All up!' or all in came up one hears it coming in a hoarse whisper and starts before it actually arrives infinite patience is necessary r e officers are sometimes eager to go ahead but once lose the last ten men at night in an unknown trench and it may take three hours to find them the other officer was bringing up the rear at last we reached our destination and the r e officer and myself told the men to work along the trench. This particular work was clearing what is known as a berm, that is, the flat strip of ground between the edge of the trench and the thrown-up earth, each side of a CT, communication trench. When a trench is first dug, the earth is thrown up each side. The recent rains were, however, causing the trenches to crumble in everywhere, and the weight of the thrown-up earth was especially the cause of this. Consequently, if the earth were cleared away, a yard on each side of the trench, and thrown further back, the trench would probably be saved from falling in to any serious extent, and the light labour of shoveling dry earth a yard or so back would be substituted for the heart-breaking toil of throwing sloppy mud or sticky clay out of a trench higher than yourself. The work to be done had been explained to the sergeants before we left our starting point. As we went along, the R.E. officer told off men at ten or five yards interval, according to the amount of earth to be moved. Each man stopped when told off, and the rest of the men passed him. 
sergeants and corporals stopped with their section or platoon and got the men started as soon as the last man of the company had passed at last up came the last man sergeant and the other officer and together we went back all along the men were on top that is why the working party was a night one sometimes they had not understood their orders and were doing something wrong a slack sergeant would then probably have to be routed out and told off the men worked like fun of course it being known to everyone's joy that this was a peace job and that we went home as soon as it was finished there was absolute silence except the sound of falling earth and an occasional chink of iron against stone or a swish and muttered cursings as a bit of trench fell in with a slide dragging a man with it for it is not always easy to clear a yard-wide berm without crumbling the trench edge in one would not think these men were worn out to see them working as no other men in the world can work for nearly every man was a miner the novice will do only half the work a trained miner will do with the same effort sometimes i was appealed to as to the yard was this wide enough one man had had an unlucky bit given him with a lot of extra earth from a dugout thrown on to the original lot so i redivided the task it is amazing the way the time passes while going along a line of workers noticing talking correcting praising by the time i got to the first men of the company they were halfway through the task at last the job was finished as many men as space allowed were put on to help one section that somehow was behind whether it was bad luck in distribution or slack work no one knew or cared the work must be finished the men wanted to smoke but i would not let them it was too near the front trenches and then i did a foolish thing which might have been disastrous the r e corporal had remained though the officer had left long ago the corporal was to act as guide back and this he was quite ready to do if i was not quite sure of the way i however felt sure of it and as the corporal would be saved a long tramp if he could go off to his dugout direct without coming with us i foolishly said i had no need of him and let him go i then lost my way completely we had never been in that section before and none of the sergeants knew it we had come from the r e dump and thither we must return leaving our tools on the way but i had been told to take the men to the divisional soup kitchen first which was about four hundred yards north of x the spot where we entered the c t and which i was trying to find for all i knew i was going miles in the wrong direction my only guide was the flares behind which assured me i was not walking to the germans but away from them the unknown trenches began to excite among the sergeants the suspicion that all was not well but i took the most colossal risk of stating that i knew perfectly well what i was doing and strode on ahead there was silence behind after that save for splashings and splodgings my heart misgave me that i was coming to undrained trenches of the worst description or to water-logged impasses still i strode on or waited interminable waits for the all up sign at last we reached houses grim and black new and awfully unknown i nearly tumbled down a cellar as a sentry challenged i was preparing for humble questions as to where we were the nearest way to x and a possible joke to the sergeant this joke had not materialized and seemed unlikely to be of the easiest when i recovered myself from the cellar mounted some steps and i found myself on a road beside a group of tommies emerging from the soup kitchen my star the only one visible i believe that inky night had led me there direct i said nothing as every one warmed up in spirits as well as bodies with that excellent soup and no one ever knew of the quailings of my heart along those unknown trenches to lead men wrong is always bad but when they are tired out it is unpardonable and not quickly forgotten as it was canteens were soon brimming with thick vegetable soup filled from a bubbling cauldron with a mighty ladle in the hot room men glistened and perspired while a regular steam arose from muddied boots and putties every one from officer to latest joined private 
was sipping with dangerous avidity the boiling fluid many charges have been laid against divisional staffs but never a complaint have i heard against a soup kitchen so in good spirits we tramped along and dumped our tools in the place where we had found them clank 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 as spade fell on spade then you may smoke was passed down the sergeant reported all correct sir and we tramped along in file soon the bursts of song were swallowed up in a great whistling concert and we were all merry the fit passed and there was silence then came the singing again which developed into hymns and that took us into our billets here we were greeted with the most abominable news of reveille at five a m but i think most of the men were too sleepy to hear it we two officers deplored our fate while eating a supper set out for us in a greenhouse our temporary mess-room that is a working party interesting as a first experience to an officer but when multiplied exceedingly by day by night in rain mud sleet and snow carrying trench boards filling sandbags digging clay bailing out liquid mud and returning cold and drenched without soup then working parties became a monotonous succession of discomforts that wore out the spirit as well as the body the last six nights before the promised rest were spent in working parties at festubert there the ground was low and wet and it was decided to build a line of breastwork trenches a few hundred yards behind the existing line so that we could retire on to dry ground in case of getting swamped out for six nights in succession we left billets at ten p m and returned by four a m the weather was the coldest it turned out eventually that winter it started with snow then followed hard frost for four nights and last but not least a thaw and incessant sleet and rain i have never before experienced such cold but on the other hand i have never before had to stand about all night in a severe frost it was actually i believe from ten to fifteen degrees below freezing point at two a m the stars would glitter with relentless mirth as the cold pierced through two cardigans and a sheepskin waistcoat i have skated at night but always to return by midnight to fire and bed bed at home people were sleeping as comfortably as usual a few extra blankets perhaps or more coals in the grate i was out five nights of the six captain dixon was on leave so we only had three officers in b and two had to go every night every night at nine thirty the company would be fallen in and marched off to the rendezvous there at ten to join the rest of the battalion there was no singing very little talking in parts the road was very bad and we marched in file the road was full of shell holes and bad generally the ice crackled and tinkled in the ruts and puddles the frozen mud inclined you to stumble over its ridges and bumps it took us the best part of an hour to reach our destination the first night we must have gone earlier than the other nights as i distinctly remember viewing by daylight those most amazing ruins there was a barrier across the road just before you entered the village just opposite were the few standing fragments of the church bits of wall and mullion here and there and all around tombstones leaning in every direction rooted up shattered split there was one of the crucifixes standing untouched in the middle of it all about which so much has been written whether it had fallen and had been erected again i cannot say the houses were more smashed crumbled and chaotic than even Quenchy or Givenchy. i remember that corner very vividly because at that spot came one of the few occasions on which i had the wind up a little why i know not we were halted a few moments when two whiz-bangs shot suddenly into a garden about twenty yards to our right with a vicious vee boom vee boom we moved on and just as we got round the corner i saw two flashes on my left then two more shells hissed right over us and fell with the same stinging snarl into the same spot just twenty yards over us this time 
I was, luckily, marching at the rear of the company at the time, as I ducked and almost sprawled in alarm. For the next minute or two I was all quivery. I am glad to know what it feels like, as I have never experienced since such an abject windiness. I believe it was mainly due to being so exposed on the hard, hedgeless road. Or, perhaps, that last pair did actually go particularly near me. At any rate, such was my experience, and so I record it. At the entrance to the communication trench, R.E. officers told us, A Company, carrying party, B Company to draw shovels and picks, and follow me. Then we started off along about a mile and a half of communication trenches. I have already said that Festubert is a very wet district, and it can easily be imagined that the drainage problem is none of the easiest. This long communication trench had been mastered by trench mats fastened down on long pickets, which were driven deep down into the mud. The result was that the trench floor was raised about two feet from the original bottom, and one walked along a hollow-sounding platform over stagnant water. The sound reminded me of walking along a wooden landing stage off the end of a pier. Every few hundred yards were passing points, presumably to facilitate passing other troops coming in the other direction. But as I never had the good fortune to meet the other troops at these particular spots, though I did in many others, I cannot say they were particularly useful. Another disadvantage about these waterlogged trenches was that the bad rains had made the water rise in several places even over the raised trench-board platform. Others were fastened on top but even these were often not enough. And when the frost came and froze the water on top of the boards, the procession became a veritable cakewalk, humorous, no doubt, to the stars and sky, but to the performers feeling their way in the thick darkness and ever slipping and plunging a boot and putty into the ice water at the side, a nightmare of painful and jarring experiences. There was one junction of trenches where one had to cross a dike full of half-frozen water. There was always a congestion of troops here, ration parties, relieving parties, and ourselves. All relieving had to be done at night, as the trenches with their artificially raised floors were no longer deep enough to give cover from view. This crossing had to be negotiated in a most gingerly fashion and several men got wet to their waists when compelled to cross while carrying an awkward-shaped hurdle. After this the trench was worse than ever. In parts it was built with fire-steps on one side, and one could scramble on to this and proceed on the dry for a while. But even here the slippery sandbags would often treacherously slide you back into the worst part of the iced platform, and so gave but a doubtful advantage. At last the open was gained, then came the crossing of the old German trench, full of all kinds of grim relics from the spring fighting. And so to our destination. On the open ground lay a tracing of white tape forming a serpentine series of contacting squares. In the blackness only two white-bordered squares were visible from one position. Each man was given a square to dig. I forget the measurements, about two yards square, I think, and two feet deep. The earth had to be thrown about eight yards back against a breastwork of hurdles. These hurdles were being brought up by the carrying parties, and fastened by wires by the R.E.s. The R.E. officers had, of course, laid our white tapes for us previously. Eventually the sentries will stand behind the hurdle breastwork, with a water ditch ten yards in front of them which obstacle will be suitably enhanced by strong wire entanglements. But all this vision of completion is hidden from the eyes of Private Jones, who only knows he has his white-taped square to dig. Arms and equipment are laid carefully on the side of the trench furthest from the breastwork, and nothing can be heard but the hard breathing and the shoveling and scraping of the other ranks. For two hours those men worked their hardest, Indeed, it was much the best job to have on those cold nights. I did more digging then than I have ever done before or since. Come on, Davies, you're all behind. 
and for ten minutes I would do an abnormal amount of shoveling, until, out of breath, I would hand the boy back his shovel and tell him to carry on, while all aglow I went along the line examining the progress of the work. We had quite a number of bullets singing and crackling across, and there were one or two casualties every night. Sometimes flares would pop over, and every one would freeze into static posture. But on the whole things were very quiet, the enemy doubtless as full of water as ourselves. That intense cold! Yet I did not know then that it is far worse being on sentry in the frost than marching and digging and I am not sure that the last night, when it rained incessantly, was not worse than all the rest. We had a particularly bad piece of ground that night, pitted with shell-holes, full of frozen water. You were bound to fall in one at last, and get wet to the waist, but even if you did escape that sticky humiliation, the driving sleet and rain were bad enough in themselves. That was a night when I found certain sergeants sheltered together in a corner and certain other sergeants in the middle of their men and the howling gale. I soon routed the former out, but did not forget, and have since discovered how valuable a test of the good and the useless NCO is of working party in the rain. Never have I longed for 2 a.m. as I did that night. My feet were wet, my body tired, my whole frame shivering with an approaching cold. The men could do nothing any longer in that stinking slush, for these old shell-holes of stagnant water were, to say the least of it, unsavoury. I was so heavy with sleep I could scarce keep my eyes open. But when at last the order came from our second-in-command, Cease work! I was filled with a dogged energy that carried me back to billets in the best of spirits, though I actually fell asleep as I marched behind the company, and bumped into the last four, when they halted suddenly halfway home. And so, at four o'clock, the men tumbled upstairs to breakfast and braziers, thanks to a good quartermaster sergeant. I drank Beauville down below, and then, in pyjamas, sweaters, and innumerable blankets, turned in till eleven a.m. Next afternoon we left Rue de Epinette, and halted at a village on the road to Lillers, whence we were to train to a more northern part of the line, and enjoy at last our long-earned rest. End of chapter 3